welcome everyone. Hello. Um, one more to join. All right. Um, hi, everybody, uh, and welcome to uh, Callow College at Meeting Minds Global 2021 uh, on this slightly cloudy here in Oxfordshire uh, Wednesday afternoon. Um, I hope you're well wherever you are in the world, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, I see some familiar names already, which is fabulous. Um, so my name is Nicola. I'm the Alumni Relations Officer at Kellogg. And um, I'm just going to do a little bit of quick housekeeping before we start. Um, you can leave your microphones unmuted during this talk. Um, our speaker is very happy for you to interrupt with a question if you have one. Um, but please try not to chatter in the background if you can, um, just because it's distracting to people. But um, it's, it's fine to stay unmuted if you have a question. Um, you're also welcome to turn your videos, uh, video feed on if you wish, um, but I will just note that this session is being recorded, so if you prefer not to, that's also fine. Um, apologies, people still arriving. Um, so on to the talk itself, uh, and I'd like to introduce you all to our speaker today, uh, who is Professor Geraldine Van Buren, QC. Um, a visiting fellow at Kellogg College, uh, Geraldine is also a barrister and member of, I should have checked the pronunciation on this, Doughty Street, Doughty Street Chambers, my apologies, um, and was appointed an honorary Queen's Counsel in recognition of her scholastic contributions to national and international law. And at the time of her appointment, there were fewer than 10 women honorary silks. So that's pretty impressive. Um, Geraldine held the cha first chair of international human rights law at Queen Mary University of London, uh, which awarded her the title of Professor Emerita. Um, Geraldine's accomplishments and contributions uh, to her field are so numerous, I can't name them all. Uh, she's helped draft less legislation on children's rights for the United Nations, as well as representing Amnesty International at the UN on children's rights. She's represented the United Nations in discussions with Iran, the Commonwealth Secretariat in Bangladesh and advised the government of Japan and UNICEF. She's also acted as an expert witness for the government of Canada, the Charity Commission in the UK, and has lectured and worked throughout Europe and the United States and in Argentina, Senegal, Uganda and Venezuela. Professor Van Buren's writings have been cited in courts around the world, including the Constitutional Court of South Africa and the European Court of Human Rights, and in legislatures, including the US Senate and the Australian Parliament. And that's barely even scratching the surface. It's therefore my great honor to introduce to you today, Professor Geraldine Van Buren. Welcome to Meeting Minds. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I wish we could all be in the same room together and uh, get a chance to, uh, to see you all and, uh, and, and to hear you. I I'm part of a small group of academics and civil society that is uh, drafting a social justice act for the United Kingdom. And I also helped draft something called the UN Convention, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which included a lot of social justice provisions uh, for, for children all over the world and which Scotland has just brought into its uh, own legislation. Uh, so I think it will be uh, timely, particularly as we've seen during the pandemic, that uh, there has been a great acknowledgement of the depth and breadth of inequality from children going hungry, growth of working families, using, having to use food banks. And before the pandemic, we of course had unfortunately Grenville Tower, an avoidable tragedy, homelessness, and the impossibility of younger and many older people as well being able to afford their own home. We've seen wonderful initiatives from Marcus Rashford, uh, charities offering food, clothing and housing, but all this deprivation to have risen in the first place as we are uh, in the top 10 of wealthy countries in the world. And all prevention to be our goal rather than uh, acting after the event should parents be forced to be worried, well, will their children get uh, food during the school holidays uh, next year? So I think we need to ask, is poverty inevitable in the United Kingdom? And are there solutions which are sustainable and strategic? 
And I think some of the answers lies in our own forgotten history. Uh, we have something, uh, we all know about Magna Carta in 1215, but actually Magna Carta had a younger sister, uh, the Carta de Forrester. And the Carta de Forrester set out rights, and it translates as Charter of the Forest, but it, it, it sets out a whole range of social justice rights. Now, these rights did not apply just to people who lived in forested areas, as we now know them to be. Uh, forest in the Norman times applied to huge swathes of land that belonged to uh, the, the king. And in fact, a quarter of all land in England uh, was forested land. So the Carter de Forester had a huge um, application for people. And it protected rights such as the right to wood. Now you might wonder, well, why do we need to protect the right to wood? Is it just to build nice uh, fires? Wood in those days was essential in the medieval time uh, for building homes and for energy. So you have nascent rights uh, to housing evolving. It protected the right to honey. Well, is that rights gone mad, a right to honey? Well, honey in those days was used both for energy, uh, this was the pre-sugar, uh, and also for medicine. It was a, an important form of healing. And the Carta de Forrester protected what is known as the rights of the vet, the greenery. And these rights, including uh, access to herbs, uh, to plants, both for eating, so we have the right to food emerging again, but also uh, in relation to medicine. And so we have a nascent right, the emerging right of access to medicines and access to health care. Now, these are medieval conceptions, but the same apply to the medieval conceptions of the Magna Carta. And yet that was widely heralded. It appears even on the, the great doors of the US Supreme Court. But the Carta de Forrester has been completely overlooked, even though it was uh, much wider application than just the bishops and the nobility of Magna Carta and applied to all free men and some, uh, some women. And so from 1217, we actually had these rights and they weren't just on paper or should I say on vellum, uh, because there are numerous examples of villagers such as the villagers in Stoneley in Warwickshire, uh, taking their petitions to the king and winning and forcing uh, the nobility to keep common land as common land so that they could sustain themselves. And the Carta de Forrester used to be read aloud with Magna Carta. They were treated, Blackstone said, absolutely identical and both appear together in the first volume of English statutes. But we now know um, only about Magna Carta and Magna Carta, which means, although David Cameron appeared not to know it, a great or greater charter, it was a comparative. It didn't mean it was more important in terms of the rights that were in it, but it was actually longer than the Carta de Forrester. So we see in English constitutional history uh, that size uh, really uh, matters. Uh, in Wales as well, they had the Huel Da, laws of Huel Da, which also for a, a narrower range of people, but applied rights to food and clothing. And, also not so well known is that in parts of Europe, we also had these social rights emerging. 1330, when you wander around uh, the romantic city of Venice, uh, it protected the right to health for all those living in Venice from 1330. And free legal aid, a right to free legal aid provided by the Doge. And even slaves of the Vikings had a right to food, albeit uh, whale meat. So we have this forgotten history where we have these rights emerging and yet we don't have them uh, on the statute book now. And in universities you know, up and down the land, we teach John Locke, we teach particular philosophers. Very rarely is Tom Paine uh, taught and certainly not in uh, law school. And yet Tom Paine uh, in the 18th century, a hero in the United States, wrote The Rights of Man, which was a bestseller in its day. So much was there an appetite from the general population for what he was saying that at least 200,000 copies uh, were sold, which is an extraordinary impact because it was a largely illiterate population of 10 million. And Tom Paine set out a very costed 
uh, case for child benefits, for pensions, and a range of socioeconomic rights. Mary Wollstonecroft, uh, slightly later, focused on other socioeconomic rights, uh, the rights to education, uh, saying that these were not rights, not charity, they're rights uh, and justice. So why have we forgotten these social justice rights? And I'm using the terms social justice and socioeconomic rights uh, interchangeably. They include uh, right to adequate housing, right to the highest attainable standard of healthcare, particularly important to the moment. They include a right to social security, rights to food, to water. Uh, and part of the problem that the association with uh, Tom Paine is very much the French Revolution. Some people thought of him as a, a traitor because he supported American independence. But you can disassociate uh, the writings of Tom Paine and of others from uh, the violence and the revolution. So South Africa had a peaceful changeover. India, which has socioeconomic rights, also uh, peaceful, uh, without violent revolution leading uh, to these rights. And so Spain has a monarchy, so it's not even uh, anti-royal. But these rights, which are absolutely critical uh, to human dignity, have been forgotten about. These rights are also uh, enshrined in a treaty called the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which has been binding on the United Kingdom since 1976. Uh, Scotland has announced its intention to bring those rights into Scottish law, but they haven't happened in relation to the rest of the United Kingdom, nor are there plans to do so. And the International Covenant sets out all these rights in what is an impartial framework which all British governments since 1976, so regardless of party political affiliation, they regard themselves as bound and they report to the UN regularly. And this is not a sort of rose colored uh, version of social justice because it doesn't have to be immediately implemented regardless of resources. In fact, the, the treaty says there is a binding obligation to use the maximum of available resources progressively to provide to everyone in the UK a right to an adequate standard of living and very importantly to a continuous improvement of living conditions. An adequate standard of living includes food, adequate housing, and it benefits everyone, citizens, non-citizens, the working poor, those on benefits, refugees and asylum seekers. And if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you see all these rights together uh, in the same international instrument. But post uh, the uh, Cold War uh, and during the Cold War, post the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, we had the Cold War and rights such as freedom of expression, privacy, the rights we see in the Human Rights Act, uh, originating perhaps from Magna Carta, due process rights, certainly, they're called civil and political rights. Uh, and we have them in the Human Rights Act, but they only represent two fifths of what the world recognizes as universal human rights. It ignores social, economic, and cultural rights. And increasingly since the 1980s, modern democracies um, drafting new constitutions and amending constitutions they contain socioeconomic rights because they see them as underpinning democracy and building trust. Uh, Ireland actually voted quite recently in its constitutional convention, which comprises of uh, political representatives, but also individuals uh, who represent the citizenry and that part, the citizens uh, represented, representative, they actually asked for these socioeconomic rights to be protected in a way that you could go to court uh, to enforce them. Most constitutions of Latin America have that already, an increasing number of Commonwealth states. And if you poll people in uh, the United Kingdom, you'll see these rights are very popular. So the right to housing for homeless people rates 60% popularity, the right to adequate uh, and the highest attainable standard of health care ranks even higher.
So these are popular rights, and this seems to be about the right time to seriously try and persuade uh, governments and political parties to see, implement and adopt a social justice act. Wonderful work on food banks, but food banks were never intended to be permanent. Um, if you look at uh, what the UN says about the right to food, it wouldn't even be reinventing the wheel for governments and the courts because under the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, they've set out what are called general comments, and it sets out precisely what governments have to do in relation to implementing a right to adequate food for everybody. And it includes food security, which will, of course, uh, if governments published, if the UK government had published uh, its food security plan, then perhaps there wouldn't have been that panic at the beginning of uh, COVID as to whether there were adequate supplies. And the UN general comment says that the right to food guarantees access and quality, and importantly, affordability. And by access, it means that when the governments are framing social policies, they'd have to consider whether weeks of delay in receiving universal credit would violate a right to social security and a right to food. So it provides transparency and accountability and avoids causing hardship. It would mean there would have to be consideration that during the school holidays when breakfast clubs were no longer functioning, whether this would impact on children going hungry and violate their rights to food. And by quality, it includes access to fresh foods and food banks have done marvelously, but they were never intended to be permanent. And it's very difficult to provide a lot of fresh foods because of storage problems. And we have also issues um, emerging uh, and now acknowledged in relation to affordability. The Child Poverty Action Group reports of single mothers choosing either to have lunch or to provide their children with supper. This is something we should never have to do in 21st century Britain. So all of these rights began with the Carter de Forrester. And we've ignored our history yet Countries poorer than us are beginning to look at those rights and implement them. So in India, the Supreme Court has protected a right to food and ordered the government to provide meals to all primary school children in India, insisting on detailed nutritional value. It's as detailed as that, the judgment. And this was ordered even though the final case had not been heard. So it avoided children going hungry whilst a lengthy law case uh, is finally determined. As I mentioned, I'm part of this group that we're drafting a socio-economic rights act for the United Kingdom, including the right to food. And the idea is so that people can just live their lives in dignity without having to choose uh, between essentials. Scotland, to begin with, has just incorporated the Convention on the Rights of the Child although the United Kingdom, for a number of reasons, is actually challenging uh, what Scotland is doing. And the United Nations has been uh, very critical of the UK on a number of occasions in relation to social justice. The UN has said the welfare state is beneficial, but alone it's not enough because it's a politically created uh, welfare state and can be subject to, and has been, to cuts and political discretions and therefore lacks certainty in providing uh, safety nets. Rather strangely, uh, there are some places where there is an enforceable right to food, if we focus on food again for a moment. Uh, there's an enforceable right to food in prison as well as uh, care homes and hospitals. And uh, we have to ask, although it's absolutely uh, important that uh, prisoners have access to the right to food. Obviously, I'm not arguing against that, but surely it should be an equal right for those uh, who've not broken the law. And the government can go to the courts uh, to force feed people, uh, but because we've forgotten our history and we're not demanding and re to reclaim those rights, uh, we can't go to the court to, uh, to, to try and have access to food. If, there's a case of starvation and, and hunger at such a low level. Yes, there, there's access under torture and human and degrading treatment, but as a society, 
we're surely not saying we want people to go down to that, that level. Now, the aim of the Social Justice Act and of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights uh, is not to bring everybody up to the same level, uh, but to have a minimum level uh, consistent with human dignity, which is why two unusual bedfellows, the Pope and the International Monetary Fund, have warned of the dangers of this growing gap of uh, inequality. The IMF, uh, I think the Pope's uh, case is quite obvious, but the IMF makes a business case. Uh, if children are hungry uh, at school, then they don't receive the full value of their education. They're unable to absorb education. If you have an ill-educated workforce, then productivity goes down. Uh, if you have a postcode lottery in relation to GP surgeries and hospitals, you need time off work uh, to go to the GP or to go to hospital. So there's business case that can be made and a cost benefit analysis to these social justice rights. So if we did have a right to food, adequate housing, you can, it sounds a rather large thing for a court to deal with, but it can be broken down. So in South Africa, in the case of Krukborn, you had uh, women and children who were homeless uh, the case was taken all the way to the Constitutional Court and the Constitutional Court said that the state, as well as improving the lot of the middle, also has to focus on the most vulnerable. And the Constitutional Court, interestingly, said that the government has to ensure that everyone benefits from access to housing finance, to mortgages. And that would mean that younger people, uh, their entitlement to, to mortgages and access to housing will be something that becomes uh, at least a government responsibility uh, to ensure that there's uh, equitable access. France has actually become party to a treaty within Europe, the sister treaty of the European Convention on Human Rights, the European Social Charter. And that has accepted judgments from the Social Charter Committee that children with autism who had suffered from a lower level of education should have access to schools and better education. Now, some may argue against social justice arguments and social justice uh, statute. And one of the reasons is uh, some people say, well, they violate the separation of powers, gives the courts too much power. But actually the cases show that they reinforce the separation of powers. Courts cannot insert their own preferences. That's the job of parliament. They look to see if a particular policy or law, excuse me, <coughs> accessing my right to water. They look to see if a particular policy or law is reasonable. And uh, it doesn't always mean that people take cases and win. In a case called Subramoni, again in South Africa, an individual, and most of these cases are by groups and communities, reinforcing the sense of community and cohesion, challenged the uh, decision of a local authority not to provide a dialysis machine access to him. And the court recognized that Parliament had decided to prioritize primary health care uh, rather than spending more on expensive dialysis machines. And the court held the government was acting reasonably. And this was done in such a sensitive way that after the judgment, and unfortunately, Mr. Subramoni died, but after the judgment, the Subramoni family actually raised money for the hospital to acquire another dialysis machine. So it builds up trust in the community and the fact that people whose voices haven't been heard and are not center stage feel they've been listened to and listened to with a seriousness and a sensitivity. It's often said that uh, maybe social justice acts as treading on parliamentary territory, but actually court judgments can reduce the heat of some political debates. The treatment action campaign case is one example where the president of South Africa denied access to HIV drugs, which was the principal source of uh, AIDS, even though almost 24% of uh, pregnant women in South Africa at the time uh, were HIV positive. It was a huge case. You had marches on the, uh, 
uh, on the courts, uh, affected the, the currency, the rand. However, after the Constitutional Court had ruled that the right to health guaranteed access to the relevant HIV drugs, and this was controversial because the president himself at the time was against it, South Africa embarked on a peaceful rollout program uh, which didn't destabilize the governments or the courts. So it's this notion of dialogue rather than a territorial battle between parliament and the courts, a notion of constitutional conversations, very different from being stuck with the 18th century Montesquieu's idea of the separation of powers. The Social Justice Act wouldn't reduce parliamentary power, but would try to ensure that the parliament and the courts both independently meet the constitutional goals of the state together. And although judges are not elected, they have been appointed uh, to uh, defend the constitution, nor is it a problem that judges are not elected. Uh, with socioeconomic rights, they're very conscious of not being elected, but that's also a complementary strength. They're able to protect fundamental rights without having to make political deals. And it's the very nature of uh, our British uh, democracy that it develops and expands and becomes more inclusive. Originally, we had only landowners voting, then men, then women, and now lowering the age to 18. So it's important, Social Justice Act, both in itself for the justice that it achieves, but also because it allows for transparency and builds trust in a society. And even in the most individualistic of states, the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, actually in his the Atlantic Charter, he spoke about freedom from want and fear. But he also later, and unfortunately shortly just before he died, called for a second Bill of Rights, arguing for these social justice rights. As the English poet Shelley said, what art thou freedom? For the laborer thou art bread, thou art clothes, and fire and food. Thank you very much. Thank you, Geraldine. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I can see we've already got uh, questions coming up in the chat. So if I may, um, I'll read those out to you. Is that Please. all right? And yeah, we'll absolutely. start off. Excellent, thank you. So we've got a question here. In view of Article 15 of the Human Rights Covenant, how does the action of vaccine nationalism, such as US, UK, sit? This is question one. And then we've also got a question um, saying, what a great talk. And that um, this person was also influenced by reading Wilkinson and Pickett's The Inner Level, which suggests all the negative psychological impacts of inequality and childhood poverty. Is that relevant to your work too? So two very different questions there. Let me, let me start with the second. Oh, they're excellent questions. Uh, thank you very <laughs> much, uh, both of you. Izzy, in relation to your question, uh, yes, I think when you're looking at social justice, you need to look at it in the broadest and, and sense. And the readings of Wilson and Wilkinson and Pickett are very important because they pointed out that uh, the greater the inequality, the less the trust in society, uh, the, the greater the bitter divisions. And therefore, uh, if we introduce Social Justice Act, we would be making society more equal. That, that is very clear. And also building a greater trust, which is why new states tend to think that it's not enough just to have civil and political rights. We need socioeconomic rights to help reinforce democracy. That's not just the role of a narrow group of rights. Uh, also, uh, an excellent question. Um, sorry, I can't see your name in relation to uh, nationalism of uh, vaccines. And we've already had the World Health Organization talking about the need to um, not to restrict. I mean, obviously, it's a global pandemic uh, and one needs to give everybody uh, access uh, to the vaccinations. Uh, you could put in the uh, Social Justice Act, actually, uh, a duty on government uh, to uh, consider aspects of aid and technical assistance in the sphere of social justice. Uh, 
uh, it will be up to uh, you uh, to propose such a thing. And uh, I think it's an, it would be an important move forward. And we've also, the, the questions are now sort of starting to line up here. How do you define, uh, so Terry, I think Terry is asking, how do you define minimum levels of food, shelter, healthcare, and education? Also an excellent question, Terry. And if you've got a spare 24 hours, I could tell you that <laughs> the, uh, the, the UN does so. But what you might look, and, and it is very difficult because I've been involved in trying to define what are known as minimum core. What is the minimum core? And should it, it, it importantly, should it apply to every country? in the world? Would it be the same minimum core if you're Bangladesh and Canada or would it vary according to uh, uh, wealth? Uh, the quickest way is to look at these UN general comments where they've actually set out what are the basic minimums and, and very importantly it applies to all levels of society so it becomes quite unifying. Those general comments are not binding but interestingly even in countries which at the time were not party uh, to the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, such as South Africa, they used in that housing case that I mentioned, the Krupporn case, they actually shaped the judgment around the, the general comments. So they are used. And as I say, it, it prevents states from repeating the wheel. Uh, they're very practical, very easy to read, and I recommend them to you. And we've got Andy now asking a question uh, despite socio-economic rights being enshrined in law, is it not disappointing that there remains significant child poverty and homelessness in the UK? How can we proceed? Well, we don't have socio-economic rights nationally. So we don't have a right to food. Uh, we do not have a right to the highest attainable standard of care. Uh, so if we had a right to food, then we, I honestly do not believe we'd be seeing the level of food banks that we see, that uh, we'd be hovering each holiday, parents are waiting to see, you know, how their children are going to eat. And, you know, and the IMF, if you personalize, the IMF was absolutely right in sapping of energy. Why would you want any parent to have to face that kind of decision? Is this what the United Kingdom is in the 21st century? So, uh, if they were part of the UK law. They are internationally, but we haven't brought them down. And it seems a bit strange. We have to report at the international level. There is a means that you can, some people living in some countries can uh, petition the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and as allege that you know, their right to food has been withheld. But the United Kingdom has never allowed that to happen. So we're not uh, such a country that we can do that. So, so we don't have a national right, and we also don't have access as individuals uh, or as a civil society uh, to the treaty bodies. So may I ask a question actually on my own <laughs> behalf then? Um, so the uh, Socio-Economic Rights Act that um, you're currently drafting, is this some kind of answer to that problem? And if so, how, how long will that take to become law? Um, it, it is one of the reasons why we've been drafting it and we've sent it out for consultation. Um, how long it becomes law, uh, I can't <laughs> say, but there, I, I, I would think there'd be quite a movement and a reassessment uh, and I, I would hope that with at least within the decade and, and maybe I mean now we have a great constitutional moment because people realize how much we'd be dependent on uh, the bravery and commitment of frontline workers, many of whom, you know, are, are finding it very hard to meet uh, housing adequacy, food and, and so forth. And I think this has made it, it shouldn't have done, this should have been visible before, but it's made it much more visible. And I think that probably uh, change people's minds uh, and particularly if they knew what other countries are doing as well you could see the possibilities. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you. Um, so Ronald uh, has asked could you comment on the role of Oxford political philosophy on the reluctance to treat positive rights on the same footing as other rights and he says I'm thinking primarily of Isaiah Berlin's influential distinction between negative and positive rights? Um, yes, it, it was 
Isaiah Berlin's uh, very influential, taught often without question in law schools and, and political departments up and down the, the land. Basically, negative rights were assumed you have the right not to be tortured, your free speech uh, not to be interfered with, whereas um, the right to housing is a positive right because it creates a positive obligation. Uh, but actually, rights are much more complex than I think uh, Isaiah Berlin um, argued and often have a mixture of positive and negative. So if you're looking at due process rights, which are often characterized as negative because you know the government should not interfere with, uh, and you have the right not to be charged or, or put on trial twice uh, for, for the same offense, uh, subject to certain exceptions. Um, actually due process, to have a proper legal aid system, which you need for due process, that involves positive resources. You have to report your law legal judgments that's involves positive uh, the right to torture okay yes you have a right not to be tortured uh, rightly so obviously absolutely essential but there's a positive duty on governments to train law enforcement officials how to extract information in a humane way consistent with people's dignity and not inflict uh, torture and inhumane conditions on people um and just building on that um john uh, thank you, John, for your question. Is there a model country in the world who has these rights in law and allows people to enforce them? Well, that's also, I, I, I congratulate you on your, your questions, actually. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure about a model, but there are a number of countries, and you can take parts of them, uh, which have dealt successfully with particular issues of social justice. So you could look at... Uh, you know, even Guatemala on the aspects of the right to food, which I know now is a, a huge issue in Guatemala, but there have been judgments granting uh, access to food for particular indigenous communities. Uh, the Supreme Court in India has been trying it, though it's not written into the binding part of the Indian constitution, it shows what uh, courts can do. So I think we have a lot to learn from the South as well as other European countries. And we tend, when we're looking at law reform, uh, to look at the United States, which has a different approach to uh, socioeconomic rights um, and a more restrictive approach. And I think we would benefit actually from looking to other countries and particularly the South. Um, and uh, we've got another question. Did the UK sign the UN socioeconomic rights covenant and should uh, this therefore be applied to the country. Yes. And an, oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> um, yes, it, it, it simply it, it ratified it, which means it's legally bound uh, since 1976, but not the what's known as an additional treaty, the additional protocol. So we as groups and individuals can't petition the UN Committee, although the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights does encourage reports from civil society and reads reports the sort of uh, and there's been quite a, a strong alternative report coordinated by non-governmental organizations in this country uh, but we haven't brought it into English law and if we brought it into UK law uh, it would make it much stronger we'd be able to enforce it the government when it's uh, introducing legislation regardless of which political party would have to defend it against uh, the uh, rather as it does with the human rights act and say it's consistent with uh, the, the social justice rights act but that doesn't happen at the moment but it should be the situation yes and uh, herman is asking does brexit matter for this discussion well, this is quite a record, actually, because we've actually not mentioned Brexit for, for most, of the, uh, most, most, most of the session. Um, it may matter in terms of strategy. So if you have a government that doesn't favour European approaches, so Spain has um, incorporated socioeconomic rights, uh, Italy has, has uh, the Netherlands, so a growing number of European states, you may want to look at other states which uh, the UK government is keen to build bridges with and trade with. Uh, so I think it matters more in strategy perhaps uh, and to your audience and than necessarily in terms of substance. 
but it may be relevant if we have shortages of food supply, for example. And therefore, if you had a guaranteed right to food, then whichever government, uh, regardless of political persuasion, was in would have to overcome that, that shortage. Uh, so our next question from Avril is particularly pertinent because it relates to food insecurity. And so Avril is asking, as identified, food insecurity has been exacerbated during the COVID pandemic and has further implications for health achievement and the overall economy. How are you specifically addressing this in your proposals? And have you sought the support of registered dietitians and nutritionists? Well, it's, it's a very good idea to uh, approach the registered dietitians and nutritionists. They have been involved at some stage, but I think it would be very good to have a, a broader consultation. So Avril, I, 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 I thank you for that. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we want to send it out to uh, consultation, to have as broad and as expert an input as possible. And um, food security has clearly uh, exasperated uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, we saw at the beginning people who were used to having access to food actually finding it difficult and then the increase in terms of food banks and the difficulties, you know, charities are doing a wonderful job but they cannot possibly meet the needs of uh, everyone. They were never designed to do so. Um, they have to prioritize and if you have a right to food then it's open to everyone. And of course there are disparities uh, within the population in terms of access to food across uh, ethnic minority groups, uh, poorer groups. Uh, we've heard, you know, as I say, the Child Poverty Action Group about uh, parents foregoing meals for their children. Uh, and these are not choices that we should be making and, and obviously uh, made far worse uh, with, with the COVID pandemic. Thank you. Um just to remind everybody, it's great that you're using the chat and please feel free to post your questions in there if that's how you're comfortable. You, you can just uh, speak out uh, yourselves. Uh, you don't need me to read your questions if you'd rather ask yourself. Um, we've got some a few minutes left. So if anyone else has a question for Geraldine, I'm sure she'd be delighted to, uh, to take yes, can I ask? Yes, please go ahead. Hello there. Hi. It, is there, a, can there be any legislation that is and remains immune from political influence, i.e. amendment? Well, if there's a growing, I mean, you're right in terms of Parliament is supreme in this country and therefore any piece of legislation can be overturned, but not if it's popular. And I think this legislation would be popular just because it affects so many people, many of whom feel disenfranchised, you know, we, we, we've seen that. So um, you can't, as you can in the United States and some countries entrench law, uh, but you can come pretty close to it. If it's unpopular, governments are not going to uh, overturn it. And obviously that popularity can be monitored. So it would be a, an act of political suicide for a government to change things which are for the benefit of society and which are popular by society and in society. It's a very good point you raise. It would operate more reliably in a, in a, in a not first past the post system of government. I'm not, I'm not sure of, of, of that because you've got a wide range of governments. Um, you know, Scotland have incorporated the Convention on the Rights of the Child and has announced its intention to incorporate the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Now, the Children's Convention actually contains a wide range of social justice rights. So it'd be very interesting to see what happens. The UK government has just announced that it's going to challenge what the Scottish government has done in relation to the Convention on the Rights of the Child and one other piece of legislation. I'm not sure that's the right signal to, to give really, uh, because those rights anyway could be just taken out of the convention and, and, and put into a, a, a separate piece of legislation. And I think the UK is a Security Council member and there's at least a moral obligation uh, to incorporate uh, the, these treaties. Uh, so that we can retain our social, you know, and justify our membership of the of the Security Council. Thank you. 
I think we've probably got time for, for one more question. And I can see that Andy has posted one in the chat. So thank you, Andy. How can democracies influence human rights in more autocratic countries? Well, I think one way is to show the benefit uh, to countries and, and sometimes to begin small in a, it depends on the level of autocracy. You know, if you're looking at genocide, that's a very different, you wouldn't clearly wouldn't uh, go in that softly, but you, you need to show the benefit and there are benefits, you know, to the government, uh, to the autocracy and to the population. And you also have to sh show a knowledge of, of the history of the country uh, and, and, and a respect, but not a respect in a way that leads to compromise. So I think that's the, that's the way to go. And, you know, these states are members of the United Nations. One can put pressure on one's own government to put pressure uh, on, on these countries uh, to become more responsive. All right. Um, thank you very much, Geraldine, for an incredibly insightful talk. And thank you to everybody who's asked questions um, today. Uh, I've been very impressed um, by by what uh, by what you've been asking. Um, I have so got yes, uh, one one little one more. I think. All right, we can squeeze you in. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Geraldine, sorry, I was just wondering if the um, Amartya Zen and Martha Nausbaum's um, capabilities approach is also something that you've um, that you've sort of examined or, or taken into it applied in your frameworks. Uh, yes, I mean, absolutely. We found it very useful. And of course, Amartya Sen is an economist, so it's very important that this is not just the work of lawyers. Uh, I think you want to base it in the broadest of approaches and the broadest of philosophies, including religious philosophies as well, uh, so that you can get as many people uh, as possible behind it. I, I can't go into further length because I can see signals um, that we're coming to a close, but uh, you, you're absolutely right. That's that's very important as well. All right. Of course, the March uh, then said that in democracies, you never have famine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Izzy, for that last question. Um, and yes, yeah, thank you very much, Geraldine, um, for sharing your wisdom with us today and to everybody for coming and for asking such fantastic questions. Um, we very much appreciate it. Um, and I hope that uh, I will see you all at some more of our sessions later this week. Thank you. Right. Geraldine, thank um, you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Please stay well, everybody. Yes. Yes, uh, <laughs> absolutely. And everybody have a good rest of your day.